Aloha and welcome to Central Union Church. I'm Pastor Mary and we are so glad that you are here with us today. Because no matter who you are and no matter where you are on your life's journey, you are welcome with us just as you are in this very moment. As we enter into this time of worship, we have some exciting things coming up at the church that we want to share with you. First, this afternoon at 2 p.m., so Sunday afternoon at 2 p.m., we'll be having a special concert in our Townside campus. This concert will be put on by the Hawaii chapter of the American Guild of Organists. And so we look forward to having a special organist with us for a beautiful concert today at 2 p.m. We hope you can join us. Next week during our worship service, we'll be collecting the One Great Hour of Sharing offering. That's one of the four special offerings of the United Church of Christ. And the funds from the One Great Hour of Sharing go to support victims of disaster and refugees, goes to support de development ministries throughout our world. So when a disaster strikes or people are displaced or, or made refugees by violence or poverty, one great hour of sharing allows us, Central Union Church, to be a part of the immediate response, as well as the long-term recovery. Through One Great Hour of Sharing, we engage in holistic development programs, including healthcare and education, agriculture, food sustainability, microfinancing, and women's empowerment. So we get to help meet immediate needs, and we work to address the underlying causes that create those needs in the first place. We wanted to share that with you this week so that you can be prepared for next week's worship service in case you feel called to give to one great hour of sharing. And then finally, next Saturday, March 9th, we'll have a, a special film screening here at Central Union Church along with a panel discussion. That's on Saturday night and the film is called Israelism. It's presented by Jewish Voice for Peace in partnership with a number of community organizations, and it's hosted by Central Union Church's community ministry, as well as Faith Action. So if you're interested in coming to watch Israelism, you can register online in the CU Weekly e-blast. Admission is free to the event, but you do need to pre-register just so that we have a count of, of how many we're expecting for that event. Friends, there's a lot coming up here at Central Union Church. But in this moment, we can release our antip anticipation and just be present. For worship invites us, just as we are, into the presence of God. So let us come into this time of worship with hopeful expectation of encountering love divine. Let us come with open hearts. Join me in a praying our prayer of invocation, which will appear on your screen. Pray with me. We praise you, O God, for the meaning that you give to our lives in and through Jesus. He is the sign of your deep and everlasting love for the world. And we rejoice in his promise to sustain us with his life. We praise you for filling our emptiness with his goodness. May our worship and praise express our thanks, O God, for your gift to us of the true bread from heaven, Jesus Christ, your Son, our living Lord. Amen. You provide the fire provide the sacrifice you provide the spirit I will open up inside you provide the fire I provide the sacrifice You provide the spirit, yeah. I will open up inside. Fill me up, God. Fill me up, God. Fill me up, God. Fill me up. Fill me up, God. 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 
During this season of Lent, we journey with Jesus to the cross and beyond. As we do, we reflect on our faith and our relationship with God and those around us. Open your hearts and minds now as God, who is beyond all the ways we usually know things, speak to us from the scriptures that we may hear the revelation of God's love through ancient script and spoken word, make vividly in the power of the Holy Spirit. Our reading is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 6, verses 24 to 35. Once a crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves that have had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed a seal of approval. Then when they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven. It is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Hear what the Spirit is saying to us today. Friends, this is the second Sunday in the sacred season of Lent, these 40 days of reflection and preparation before Easter. And this season represents a journey inward into our hearts as we take stock of our lives, our attitudes, and our actions. And so throughout our Lenten worship, we've been thinking about the essentials for the journey of life and of faith. You might remember that two weeks ago, we reflected on finding direction in our lives. And we talked about a compass that guides us in the way to go. Pastor Rashawn shared with us that God is our life's destination, that we're always headed towards God. And Christ, who is the way, is the compass that helps to guide us towards God. And then last week, we talked about a flashlight, a light to shine forth so that we can see where we're going. We found that God is the very source of light and that Christ is God's light shining in the world. Each and every one of us can be kindled from this one light so that we too can shine as a light for others. This week, we turn our minds to another essential for the journey of Lent and the journey of life. Today, we'll talk about bread, about that which nourishes and sustains us. So as we enter into this time of reflection, Join me in a spirit of prayer. Holy and living God, draw near to us in this time. Center our hearts and our minds on you. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This week, I read an interesting article that talked about the way that different people host guests for a meal. Now, according to the article, when serving a meal, guests, or hosts, excuse me, interact with their guests in a different way. The host with the fewest material resources, for example, or, or a person with an economically challenging background, will often ask their guests if they've had enough to eat. They're generally very concerned with their guests having their bellies full, with no one going away hungry from their meal. Whereas hosts who are of a more middle-class background worry most about how a meal tastes. Is the turkey dry or, or do the spices blend well together? How is everything hitting the palate of the guests? 
But those who are on the high end of the economic spectrum are most concerned about something else entirely. For those who are wealthy, there's usually a lot of concern about a meal's presentation, about the way that it's plated, and the colors of the dishes. Fascinating, isn't it? Where might you fall within that spectrum? And do you agree with that article's assessment? I hope that many of us here are more concerned about the taste or the presentation of the food. I hope that most of us have not had to experience the kind of deep hunger that the article speaks about for the first group. Though I'm sure that there are some of us that have, that have had that aching in the stomach that goes on for days when there just isn't enough food to go around. Turning to our scripture today, I imagine that there were some there who probably knew that ache of deep, deep hunger. Some within that crowd that was following Jesus knew the reality of deep hunger. The reason I think that is, is that just before this story is one of the most amazing miracles in all of our scriptures. Jesus has just gathered people together and has fed over 5,000 people. From a few measly loaves and a couple of fish, an abundance came, with baskets overflowing with leftovers. This crowd, they absolutely stuffed themselves. And as a result, after their meal was over, they tried to grab Jesus and to forcibly make him king. To me, that speaks of hunger, doesn't it? It speaks of a desperate need that was finally fulfilled for them. In the story, Jesus narrowly escapes, and he ends up walking on water to find the disciples so that they can get over to the other side of the lake. But this crowd that has gathered, they just do not want to let Jesus go. And so they embark on their own journey, a journey to go and find this one who saw their needs and then miraculously met them. When our story picks up today, the crowd has just found Christ again. And we might expect Jesus to say something like, wow, good job, like you followed me, just like I'm always telling everyone to follow me. You really did, you've come and found me. But Jesus has a totally different reaction. He tells them, you're not here because of the sign that you saw. You're here because I gave you something to eat. Basically, he says, you're here because you're hungry again. I don't know about you, but for me, that it seems a little bit harsh and a little bizarre. I mean, surely this crowd could have walked somewhere much closer to where they were for a meal. But they've come miles and miles to find Jesus. That makes me think that perhaps Jesus is talking about something else here. Maybe he's not talking about physical hunger anymore. The crowd, I think, was hungry for more than just physical bread. They were hungry for so much more. And I don't think that they're so different from us. I'm convinced that we live as a hungry people in a hungry world. Everyone is looking for something that will sustain us, something that will nourish life, something that will emotionally feed and energize us something that will satisfy our longing for, for meaning. Because we hunger to be acknowledged or to be fully known. We hunger to belong. We hunger for justice in our world or, or for something that we can't quite put our finger on. Have you ever felt that way? That there's just something missing and you can't quite figure out what it is? I know I have felt that way. On our journey of life, we are spiritually hungry, seeking not just to be filled. We are seeking fulfillment, fulfillment in our very souls. Now, I want to be really clear. I don't think that this is overriding the need to care for the physical hunger of ourselves or for others. Of course, Feeding others is our call as a people of faith. And frankly, it's our call as, as human beings. 
It is really hard to think about the spiritual when your stomach is growling and when you're struggling just to survive. So I want to share that if that's you today, if you're hungry, physically hungry, please call the church and we will help to find food for you. Jesus, of course, cared about that too. After all, he had just fed this crowd, right? But I do think that to that crowd, on that particular day, Jesus had another important lesson. Christ is speaking to the spiritual hunger, to the deep hunger of the soul, when he says, don't work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life. This crowd that was standing before him, they had been seeking nourishment in all the wrong places. They'd been eating all the wrong spiritual foods. They'd been nourishing themselves with rules, with law that allowed them to judge others. They'd been hungering for a religion, for a God that gave them absolute certainty about the questions of life. And they'd been feasting on a desire for revolution, for an overthrow of the Romans, and rightfully so. But this was not enough to sustain or fill them. Because this, Jesus says, this is the food that perishes. It's so easy to fall into the trap of seeking fulfillment in all the wrong places. We do the same thing. I'm convinced of it. We try to find nourishment and sustenance, too, in the things of this world. Some of us try everything to escape that feeling of emptiness, that soul hunger. We chase the breads of, of money or of possessions, of achievement or power. We seek the bread of control over our lives. Sometimes we chase the bread of hostility or revenge or addiction. Maybe we sample the loaves of, of beauty or social media, seeking acknowledgement from others. We even try to feed ourselves with relationship, feasting on reassurance, affirmation, and comfort from loved ones. But here's the problem, friends. All of these things are perishable, and they'll all let us down. The world is full of bread, and yet we remain hungry, empty, and searching. It doesn't matter how much we own, how many awards we receive, how much security we amass, because the more we eat of those things, the hungrier we become. And it can leave us feeling hopeless, because not all bread sustains, not all bread grows life, not all bread is nutritious. The bread that we need for the journey the bread that does sustain is so much more than any of these things. Jesus tells the crowd, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go away hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The truth of the gospel, of this gospel, is that God is the only one who can nourish and sustain us for the journey. As St. Augustine wrote, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in God. The source of all being is the very same one who reaches out to us again and again to fill our hearts and our souls. And it is in Christ, in the Spirit of God, that we find our nourishment. When we turn to God with vulnerability, whether in prayer or in silence, in nature or in the scriptures, we find that we are loved beyond measure, that God is over the moon about us you will find that you are cherished more than you can imagine and that the God of love has sought and continues to seek true and deep relationship with you just as you are. You matter. You are treasured. You are worthy of love and acceptance. In God, we are affirmed, made whole, and blessed. Friends, this love, this acknowledgement of our worth and our identity and our call is the nourishment that we need for the journey of life and of faith. When we savor the bread of life, our God helps us to see ourselves and to see our world more fully 
and so helps us to determine how we might best spend our efforts, our days, our talents, to make a difference in our world. One of the ways that we fill our hunger, that we enjoy the bread of life, is to come to the communion table. Not just to eat our fill, but to be nourished in our faith, to feel God's love a little more deeply, to know ourselves and our worth a little more clearly, and to understand how our hands and feet can build God's kingdom of justice and peace a little more fully. We come to the table as a sign of our willingness to meet Christ and to be embraced, known, and transformed by him. And we leave the table as bread for others, bread for the world. So church, beloved friends, let us prepare ourselves to partake of the one bread, the bread of life. Amen. Let us break bread together. Friends, now you and I have an opportunity to respond to what we've experienced today. We have a tangible opportunity to break the bread and to pour the cup, to feast on the bread of life. In the United Church of Christ, we believe that this sacred meal of communion is a sacrament. It is that which represents something greater, a sign which points us to communion with God. And today, as we savor these elements, we trust and believe that God will draw near to us, filling us and renewing us, reminding you and reminding me of our identity as beloved children of God. Friend, you are of infinite worth in God's eyes. You are blessed and held and supported and beyond loved. As we share together in this feast, may we individually and community be renewed and encouraged for the journey ahead. Friends, all are welcome at the table of Christ. You are welcome at the table of Christ. There is nothing that you could ever do that would make you unworthy to come here because Christ himself knows your very heart 
and he invites you here. So come, come and feast on the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Come and find the one who has been seeking you all along. Come and share in holy and blessed community. We remember that on the night when Jesus would be betrayed, he gathered around the table with his closest friends, with his disciples, those with whom he'd been traveling and teaching for many years. And on that night, he took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, and he passed it around to each of them, saying, Take and eat this, for this is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And after giving thanks to God for it, he poured it and passed it around, saying, Take and drink, for this is the cup of the new covenant, my life which is poured out for you and for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Friends, join me in a spirit of prayer over these elements. Blessed are you, eternal God. We thank you for calling forth the creation, for forming us in your image and for calling us blessed, calling us to be a blessing. We remember that God fed the people with manna in the wilderness and that Joseph and his brothers reconciled with a feast. Holy One, blessed are you and blessed is Christ the incarnation of your love. We remember that Christ preached your mercy, that he raised the dying and restored the ill to lives of wholeness and of service. On the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he fed the hungry crowds. And in an upper room, he gave us this meal, this communion meal as the sign of his abiding presence. In company with saints and sinners, O God, people in every time and place, people beyond time, we come before you with praise and thanksgiving. We gather here now to share in this meal, ready to be fed and nourished and sustained. Through this meal, we are ready for you to awaken new hungers within us. And so we ask that you would bless these elements, that through this sacred meal of grain and of grape, you would turn us outward again, and that you would encourage us to walk in Christ's footsteps, setting us to do the work that is ours to do. May we feed this world with compassion and justice, hope and peace. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, the bread of life, the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, this is the bread of life, the body of Christ broken for you and for all. Let's share it together. This is the cup of blessing, the cup of salvation, the cup of the new covenant. Let us share it together. Pray with me. God, we give you thanks for meeting us here in this meal. We pray that You would bless us as we go out, that we might be your hands and feet, your people and your heart. In Christ's name, amen. There are many essentials we claim for our faith journey. 
but ultimately it is our active love that reveal who we worship. In this time of offering, I invite you to commit to give of your whole selves, give of your time, talent, and treasure with the expectation that they be used to further God's dream for our world. May we commit ourselves and give as we are able with generous hearts. Friends, it's been a blessing to worship with you this day. Now may the God of the journey, the one who creates, redeems, and sustains us, send us out. Go in peace, for you do not go alone. God goes with you. Go in peace, for when your journey leads to the wilderness, remember that Christ has been there before you, and he will sustain you. Go in peace to bless this world and to receive blessing in kind. Amen. <laughs>